Now, if Gilgamesh had continued on his wanderings about another 250 miles south beyond Dilmun, he would have arrived at the civilization of Magan, which is where present-day Oman is, where he would have encountered a very different uh, tradition of burial practices. Recall that uh, on Dilmun, the graves, for the most part, were of single individuals uh, in graves under gently sloping hills of sand, inside of which uh, a single individual lay along with his pottery. But if he had continued to Magan, he would have found a completely different tradition whereby the dead were simply thrown collectively inside of these large round limestone mausolea that had a diameter of about 12 meters with, an in, with interiors that were divided by uh, a discontinuous cross wall off which, off which four smaller walls ran to create 10 separate grave chambers. The height of these structures were about two and a half meters and they tended to be carved with little enigmatic figures on their entrances, such as maybe one might depict a camel and an oryx, another might show a pair of cheetahs mauling a gazelle, another a wandering snake, imagery that's not that dissimilar from the animals carved on the stone blocks at Gebekli Tepe. But on the inside of these, of these tombs, we might find as many as 200 individuals all thrown in together with their bones carelessly intermixed. So we've entered uh, another realm here entirely, the realm in which the individual is absorbed into the collective social organism, like a drop of rain hitting a pond that becomes characteristic of India all the way down to the present day in which the emphasis is no longer on the maintenance of one's individuality, but rather upon absorption into the collective mystical body. Uh, and so what I wanna do then is move on uh, to the Indus Valley. The oldest site in the Indus Valley is a place known as Mergar, which dates back to about 7500 BC. Uh, this is an agricultural site at which right about 7500 BC, um, uh, the whole package appears ready-made in which we have houses that are rectangular. They're made out of mud bricks with flat thatched roofs. The houses are divided on the inside into four to six rooms. Uh, there might be some other structures like granaries. Uh, there's no pottery yet at the earliest levels, but there are animals such as goats there, and uh, there are crops already, domesticated wheat, einkorn, and emmer, mostly, with barley, jujubes, and dates. Now, uh, some scholars like to maintain that this is an entirely indigenous development, but we've already seen all this stuff originate in the Near East. We saw mud brick architecture coming out of Jericho. We saw rect rectangular house architecture was invented at Muraibet, 9500 BC. Um, some of these houses were, at Mergar were entered from the roof. The entrances were from the roof, as at Chadal Hoyuk and Ashikli Hoyuk and places like Um Dabagia in the Near East. Uh, and wheat, at least to this day, is not native to the Indus Valley. So the wheat and the goats would have had to have been brought in from somewhere else, probably over the Bolan Pass. So this all comes over as a package about 7,000 BC, right over. The mountains. And now, so to look at the dead at Marigar, the dead were buried at Marigar in the courtyards between the houses. And I want to look at one of these graves right now. So just to examine one of them, uh, in one we find an adult lying in an ochre stained oval pit. So we've got red ochre now here that's continued all the way from the, the world of the Paleolithic with the cro -Magnons. Uh, in later levels of the site, this red ochre will be replaced by a red shroud over the individual, and that red shroud probably becomes, transforms into the yellow shroud that the Hindus to this day put over their dead. Uh, the god Yama, the lord of the dead in the Indian underworld, was said to wear a red, red clothing, in fact. Now, the ornaments in this grave consisted of a necklace of cut dentalium shells and another of small concentric circles of white steatite, with a large bead of lapis lazuli. This, this burial, by the way, dates to 7000 BC. On his chest was a large flat shell disc perforated in the center while located at the back of the skull. There were seven small turquoise beads. There were also two anklets made of flat hexagonal calcite beads. And there was an offering of five goats that had been laid at the foot of the skeleton, which was aligned on an east-west orientation with the head pointing east and the body lying on its left side. So the face would have been looking to the south. Now, in later Vedic mythology, there are a couple of interesting indicators already with this burial that seem to be pointing to later Vedic belief, belief systems. For one thing, the fact that the face is looking to the south is interesting because the underworld for the Hindus is in the direction of the south. That is the realm of the ancestral dead, the south. 
Also, uh, in Vedic mythology, the god Pushan is the guardian of all roads, especially the road that leads to the afterlife, and goats are associated with him as his primary vahana. And here we have uh, a burial of goats because the goat uh, is able to access difficult pathways along hills and mountaintops. So perhaps the goats buried with this man were designed to guide him to the underworld. Um, we've already seen the red uh, cloth that may later turn, uh, the, the ochre here that turns into the red cloth that may later turn into the yellow shroud and so forth. So we can already see uh, indicators and motifs that are pointing in the, potentially anyway, in the direction of later Hindu mythology. Now, cotton seeds first make their appearance at Marigar for the first time anywhere in the world, about 5500 BC. And they are also found as little tiny seeds inside of a copper bead on a wrist bracelet from a man in a grave. Um, so Mergar is a site that, is, uh, that recapitulates the pre-pottery Neolithic. Eventually pottery and metallurgy both arrived there and a developed tradition of the carving of interesting little figurines, clay figurines, as well as at later levels of the site, puzzling male figurines holding infants like a Madonna, only it's, it's with a male figurine. That's a little strange. Um, but all this evolves over a long period, and the, ne the ne sort of Neolithic period in India, in Western India here, that takes place is a period that stretches over five distinct stages that goes from the period of Marigar, 7500 BC, down to the so-called mature Harappan phase that dates from 2600 to 2500 BC. And there are a number of phases. I don't want to recount all of them right now. They each have their own structural characteristics, except for the last phase. The last phase is known as the early Harappan phase that begins 3200 BC to 2600 BC. So it's contemporary with the so-called uh, Jemdet Nazar period. That is the period that immediately follows the period of Uruk in the Near East, in the Mesopotamian world, the um, Arukian period. And it's during this period that we see two cultures begin to emerge that separate out into two distinct culture zones, one in the north, one in the south, once again, recapitulating our phenomenon that we have seen so often through the history of civilization in which we began with the Paleolithic where we saw a Western uh, Orignatian culture and a Gravet Eastern Gravettian culture. Uh, in, the Mes in the Mesopotamian world, we had the Halafians versus the Samarans. And in the Egyptian world, we had Upper Egypt versus Lower Egypt. Here, we have two distinct cultures, a Northern Septa Sindhu culture, which is located out on the alluvial plain uh, of the Punjab, which is marshy and uh, irrigation has to be rediscovered all over again to harness it. And then the southern culture is a Balakistani culture that's located in the south. And each have their own separate burial traditions. Cremation is the burial tradition that is the primary tradition in the north. So it has migrated over the mountain ranges from its spread where we saw it originating in the pre-pottery Neolithic about 6500 BC in eastern Turkey. It has migrated over all the mountain ranges across northern Iraq and Persia and come right down here into India so that now they are practicing cremation with the northern Sindhu culture. Sindhu simply means the seven rivers. Um, and in the south, though, they don't practice cremation. They don't burn their dead. The south maintains its connections with the Persian Gulf and with Dilmun and with southern Mesopotamia. There's a vast wealth, wealthy and lucrative trade route going on that connects the southern culture with what's going on in, uh, in the southern Mesopotamian world. And they buried their dead in the south in brick-lined graves, little individual brick-lined graves, very often with collective burials, as we saw at Magan. Uh, in the Uman Nar mausoleum, round mausoleum burial style of collective graves. They tended to bury their dead in collective graves in the south as well. The south also did not have uh, a developed tradition of carving clay figurines the way the north did. The north developed a, a strong tradition of figurine carvings and their pottery accordingly in the north, what's called the Kotdiji pottery, uh, has abstract geometrical decorations, whereas the pottery in the south, which is known as the Emery Nal pottery, tends to have figures on them, goddesses and bulls mostly, lots of bulls, uh, as though to compensate for the fact that they didn't have a three-dimensional uh, tradition of, of sculpture. Uh, the architecture in the south tended to be built on stone foundations, mud brick on stone foundations, whereas in the north they didn't use stone foundations. But the north developed and invented mud brick eventually gave rise to the invention in the north of baked brick, which becomes one of the main structural characteristics 
of the creative explosion, the, the fourth of our singularities that we'll get to in a moment, which characterizes the rise of the mature Harappan period about 2600 BC. Uh, so these are two very different cultures with two different traditions of disposal of the dead, two different kinds of pottery style, two different kinds of architecture, and their fusion right about the period of 2600 BC leads to the birth of Indus Valley civilization. So now something interesting and rather strange takes place with the birth of this civilization uh, because right in this century, the 2600 to 2500, at a number of sites in both the north and the south, there occur widespread destructive fires and site abandonment. Uh, sites are burned all over the place and they're abandoned in favor of the construction of new cities to replace them. The new cities in the south are places like Mohenjo-Daro, which Mergar was not far from Mohenjo-Daro, and Mergar now shuts down at this time and its population migrates to Mohenjo-Daro. And the <clears throat> great cities in the north are Harappa and Kalibangan. Uh, in the south, there are other cities like uh, Lothal, but the strange thing about these cities is that they're all laid out on the same ground plan. We have a, a rectilinear street orientation. They tend to be aligned on a north-south axis. Uh, they're laid out on this north-south axis and they tend to have, they don't have ziggurats, but what they do have is a high mound or a citadel that overlooks the rest of the city. And the citadel in the north at Kalibangan is interesting because it preserves some of the characteristic differences. These citadels, the way they manifest in the north versus the south, that show the seam of where there once was two separate cultures, but are now the same homogenous culture. Uh, in the north, there's a fire temple in, on the mound of Kalibangan. There are these little fire mounds where a fire cult was clearly up and running. Whereas, as is well known, the great bath that's found on the high citadel mound at Mohenjo-Daro is a great sort of large rectangle-shaped rectangle baptismal bath. We recall that on the island of Dilmun, right around the corner in the Persian Gulf, there was a, a baptismal cult there practiced as well. Whereas the fire altars have come over the, across from Central Asia into the northern realm, so they've inherited the traditions of fire. Uh, and we get uh, the widespread distribution of both writing, which appears in the north and the south, uh, a, a postage stamp art size of the carving of these little miniature steatite seals with this wonderful developed uh, iconography, a whole zoology of animals, were tigers and uh, minotaur men and half animal, half human creatures and goddesses. And we also find uh, characters in yoga posture on these little steatite seals. Uh, we get wedge-shaped, the baked bricks that are invented in the north also spread to the south, and there are wedge-shaped bricks, new sewers, new drains, lots of hydrological technology. This is a culture that is built on the management of water. They were experts at managing water. They weren't very good at art. There's not a whole lot of art going on in this culture. Uh, there are these little small carvings that can be held in the hand, and there are the wonderful uh, postage stamp size images on these steatite seals, but there are no frescoes. Uh, painted onto their walls, and then they weren't very competent artists, this, this civilization, I'm afraid. This was a civilization of engineers uh, and civic designers, and the, the fascinating thing is that all of this tends to happen overnight uh, within the course of a century where all the cities are on the same page. They all have the same architectural plan, the same layout, the same design which is a little odd, and there can only really be one of two explanations for this, which is to say either these two cultures were unified by force militarily, the way Narmer in Egypt unified Upper Egypt and Southern Egypt militarily, or, but see, the problem with that is we don't have much evidence for weapons. These were mostly a peaceful people. There's not a lot of weapon technology going on here. Um, most likely, the second explanation, which is to say there was a single religion that, that originated most likely in the north, which is the direction from which the little proto-Shiva figures come on these stamp seals, and the north, uh, the, the highlands, the mountainous world is the realm from which yoga is supposed to have come, and yoga may originally have been tied in with whatever this religion was that would have been some sort of a religion based upon purification and sin, because common to both the cult of fire and the cult of water is either the burning away or the washing away of sin, uh, of karma, of dross, of the mind's infection by carnal desires, or uh, too much of a preoccupation with the material world. There must have been some sort of religious entity that organized all of this, and the fact that already we can see here that this was a priestly, not a military uh, elite that organized all of this, 
is grounds for seeing how later the Brahman caste in Hindu civilization becomes the highest of all the, of the castes. You can already see that here in the Indus Valley, this civilization being organized by this, this caste, this cultural elite. And um, now what happens to the dead during this period is also interesting too, because uh, as we should expect, we, we've arrived here at the fourth of our creative singularities in which we get a sudden technological explosion the invention of a whole civilization and urban cities, writing, mathematics, and so forth, all of that is going on. And once again, as in our previous creative singularities, especially the one in Mesopotamia, the dead have been moved out of the way. Now, as we saw at Mergar, the dead were buried in and among the houses. They were buried in the courtyards, uh, sometimes under the houses, but mostly in the courtyards. Here in these cities, the dead are moved out as they were in Mesopotamia into separate cemeteries that are located usually to the west or the northwest of the cities. Uh, there are cemeteries found at Lotal, Sirkotada, Harappa, and Kalibangan. No cemetery was ever found for Mohenjo-Daro because Mohenjo-Daro was probably washed away. It was very, it had a flooding problem from the Indus River. And uh, the dead are located in these separate cemeteries. Um, sometimes there's a very slovenly attitude toward the burial practices. These people, the Indus Valley people, did not care that much for the cult of the dead. Uh, the practices of these burying the dead in these, uh, some, in some cases they were individual brick-lined graves. At others they were collective. Didn't care too much for them. Sometimes the bones exist in fragmented conditions. Sometimes they're mixed together. Um, and the axis of layout of the dead has changed, whereas we looked at that burial from Mergar where we saw a body laid out on an east-west axis, the dead now are laid out on a, a north-south axis. That is to say, they're aligned uh, north-south with the head in the north and the feet in the south, uh, which might indicate a shift from a solar orientation uh, at Mergar, which where the dead were laid out on an east-west axis, to a polar orientation where the dead are oriented toward the circumpolar constellations of the north. Very possibly it was thought that as in Mesopotamia with the period of the Samaran peoples and then later on in Egypt the, the souls of the dead were carried up to the pole star. Later uh, at a very late cemetery that's associated with Harappa that comes in at the end around 1900 BC we find these pottery vessels where peacocks are shown carrying uh, little individual men up to the stars. So it's very possible that the soul was ferried to the upper world in the Egyptian pyramid text. The soul was very often pictured as being carried up to the stars. The Ka of the pharaoh would ride on the back of an ibis bird to the stars. Here they rode on the backs of peacocks. The peacock is also a characteristic Indian animal, a Hindu animal. And um, so that may have been, that may account for the orientation to shift from solar to polar. But the dead, for the most part, have been put out of the way. Uh, and uh, so we get a creative explosion that happens and takes place here. Now, the creative explosion here is different, though, from what happens uh, with the creative explosions that we've seen before in the Paleolithic, in the Pottery Neolithic, and with Mesopotamia, in that it was very brief and short-lived. Uh, it's as though the Indian civilization, the Harappan civilization here, is open to creativity and new ideas, but settles on them very quickly, and they become very stiff, very rigid, very conventionalized. And after 2500 BC, for the next few centuries, there is simply no development in this civilization whatsoever. It differs from these other civilizations in that respect. There are no new technologies that come in. It all starts at the beginning, and what's there at the beginning is what's there at the end by 1900 BC, when all this is wiped out. Uh, it's the same exact techniques, the same exact um, carving of little beads and drilling holes in carnelian and carving on steatite, the same hydro technologies of baked bricks and kilns and drains and wedge-shaped bricks for sewers. It's all the same and it never changes. And the art traditions don't go through much of a development either. They're, they're also stiff and frozen. And uh, this is similar to later India, where the conservatism in later India is also very strong and also discourages innovation. But we've seen that the cult of the dead have been moved out of the way, but apparently it didn't have a very strong effect and didn't last very long. And it may be the case that there was just too strong of a reverence for the city elders. Whoever this brilliant genius elite was that suddenly appeared and had this idea for the organization and unification of the two cultures of the South and the North, the Sindhu culture in the North and the Balakistani culture in the South, 
that the basis for this unification took place with these geniuses and the rest of the society simply admired them to such a degree that there was a conservation of culture forms that were simply never departed from. And so the societies became very stiff and uh, they just ceased to develop and the only direction they went was downhill. Entropy gradually increases but evolution does not take place in these societies. Gradually entropy seeps in Mohenjo-daro uh, is flooded again and again and again and every time they have to rebuild it they have to go get uh, they have to cut down more wood from the forests around them to use it to burn uh, the kilns to make more baked bricks to rebuild the city so they're gradually deforesting the areas around them and the city keeps getting flooded again and again and again and they keep having to rebuild it and every time they rebuild it the architecture is sloppier and more and more slovenly every time you can see them gradually being defeated here and pretty soon the city was just surrounded by water by malarial stagnant water and indeed there is evidence that there may have been a plague here we do find at about 2000 BC lots of dead bodies are found uh, all over the city of Mohenjo-daro in hasty burials where it looks like they're just thrown into some area. Originally it was thought that the Indo-Aryans came down on the city and attacked it and killed it and wiped it out, but it looks like before the Indo-Aryans before the Indo-Aryans got to these cities, uh, it looks like they were already entropically wiping themselves out. Um, they were just slowly succumbing. And then as the process takes place, what we find is that what we find is that as this uh, process of entropy takes place and gradually drains the life out of these cities, uh, they're abandoned. And one by one, the cities become abandoned, uh, the populations become nomadic, they begin to leave. And I think that by the time the Indo-Aryans do arrive on the scene, and they do come over the, through the mountain passes, they come on the scene around 15, 16, 1700 BC, right in there. They already come upon a civilization that has gone through its life cycle, that has been drained dry by entropy and a too rigid conservatism that has locked them into an inability to deal with change. And the, what's left there for the indo aryans is just simply leave takings, which they proceed to pick apart and destroy. Uh, a quick paragraph here from one of the great authorities, Gregory Pozel, uh, whose books on this I highly recommend, where he says uh, at the end, over the next two or three centuries, there was a progressive deterioration of urban life and sociocultural complexity at Mohenjo-daro and in the Indus civilization generally. The symbolic value of water fades away, brick-lined wells, the metropolitan drainage system and bathing platforms are no longer constructed. The iconographic themes of the ideology of the Indus civilization are slowly lost. Figurines, pottery, seals, and other glyptic items. Technological innovation comes to a virtual end and much of the mature Harappan high technology is no longer used. Baked brick architecture, drainage systems, seal cutting, etching carnelian, drilling of long carnelian beads, stoneware, bangles. Some technological innovations such as bronze and faience survive, but they are in the minority. In other words, India at this time enters into a dark age, and it is a dark age that lasts uh, mostly all through the second millennium until the Vedic Aryan civilization is up and running, which we will take a look at next time. Uh, this is India's Dark Age. Uh, we see writing and culture slide off the stage and thus clearing the way for the coming of the next great phase, the great cultural phase of India that begins with the coming of the Vedic Aryans, and we'll look at that next.